We have set off the fire alarm and have nothing to do but to wait. I do not think we will have to wait for long. I know you're out there. I know that you're afraid. You're afraid of change. I don't know the future. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. Welcome to the third season, volume, edition, whatever you want to call it, of the podcast known as The Other Side of Truth. I'm your host, Paul Kimball, and my guest today, as always, at the start of every season, it's kind of a tradition here, sort of like opening day in baseball or bad Godzilla movies, Greg Bishop, all the way from Los Angeles, California, where it's probably sunnier and warmer than it is here in Nova Scotia. Hello, Greg. Hey, Paul. What what made you think of the Godzilla movies? Uh, probably because there's a new Godzilla movie coming out in two weeks. <laughs> so before we came on the show, and I put the term show in quotation marks, before we came on the Skype chat that I'm recording, which might or might not be a show, you were saying that you were on your show last night. And you said some of, you were whining, not whining, sorry, you were ruminating, lamenting even, about why, why am I doing this? Why am I still doing this? And somebody called in. Is that how it went down? Tell us the story, because this will be the launching point for a conversation that nobody wants to hear, except us. Excellent. Well, that's why we do these shows. Steve from Dallas, Texas called up and first said, don't stop doing your show. A lot of people out here really like it, and it's one of the few things that, are, that we listen to. And... Um, Please don't stop doing the show. That, that's all he said. And then we went on to talk about, you know, movies, uh, history. I had to force the UFO and paranormal subject in there. We talked about that a bit. And it was a fun show. And I thought, okay, it kind of talked me off the ledge a little bit. Have you seen those posts by Norio Hayakawa? I'm sure you have on, on Facebook where he just keeps getting more and more and more cynical and he just he, he he's it's like kind of a final straw for him. There's no evidence whatsoever uh, that aliens and I agree with him have ever visited this planet. And you people are just arguing. He finally put up a post saying, "I give up." <laughs> yeah, I did see that. I know it really really irritates my friend Mike McDonald, the filmmaker here who did the Shag Harbor incident, because he just thinks that uh, Hayakawa is. I, I suppose it probably falls in the category of why are you even bothering posting these things if you're if you're so <laughs> cynical, then go away and do something else that you're not so cynical about. I think that's probably what Mike's feeling is, but I don't know. Yeah. Take Lance Moody, for instance. Even though Lance is an arch skeptic, and he is a bit cynical, but at least he seems to have a joie de vivre about it all, even as he's lambasting puddle headed lazy thinkers. Mm -hmm. But Norio Hayakawa in his post doesn't seem to have that joie de vivre yeah but when you meet him he completely does have a joie de vivre you, you, you know about his life well yes but not about the paranormal or yes. ufos yeah i'm sure he has a, everybody has a joie de vivre about something well, i guess even gene steinberg has a joie de vivre about something <laughs> iphones and kia optimas and and all sorts of new stuff but it doesn't come through in his posts at ufo updates or wherever no he's uh the funny thing is, I think he was on, he's one of those people that's been, you know, converted. He used to go to Area 51 with, a, like, some fairly unstable people and, you know, say that there were aliens there and that the government was covering it up. And he was very heavily in with that group. Like, some people that I think were kind of dangerously nuts. I never thought he was. And he's like done a 180 on that and finally just said, I can't really support any of these ideas anymore because there's no, there's not a hundred percent proof for any of them, which I think is wrong. Say either, either or is not good with the UFO thing and paranormal. 
I think what he's tired of is arguing with people that keep saying the same stupid thing over and over and not listening to what he said ha- says half the time. I'm sure I don't know why any of the other quote unquote skeptical people even bother, especially the ones that seem to be on some kind of crusade. He's typical in a way of a lot of people who were ardent super duper true believers at one point it never works the other way you never really see super duper true debunkers or skeptics or whatever you want to call them disbelievers sort of have a moment where they switch and become super duper true believers so it doesn't really it's like time it's easier to travel forward theoretically than it is backward so the disbelievers are the ones forward in time but you actually do run into a fair number of true believers who eventually when and this was something that happened in in religion whenever you get one of these sort of uh, end of the days thing where they predict the date, hey, this is when Jesus is going to arrive, and oh, Jesus didn't show up. And eventually people get tired and they walk away from that that movement. And that seems to be what happens in the paranormal. You get so many people saying, oh, disclosure, for instance, with the UFO thing is, is right around the corner. Or, hey, this is season number one of Ghost Hunters, and we're going to find some ghosts and crack it. And suddenly it's season number 15 or whatever, and hey, they're still doing the same thing. And I think people, maybe like your friend Norio, sort of go, ugh. Because they they wanted so much to believe, and they've had that sucked out, so they jump right over people like you and I, who have always sat in the middle, and they go right to the other side of, ah, this is all crap. Well, a lot of people think that you don't sit in the middle, but I would think those tend to be people that are, like, on the heavy believer side. Oh, I was going to say stupid, but on the heavy believer side is a more polite way of putting it. Yeah. Well, people who let belief rule above every other thing that's going on. There was another post I saw somewhere where it was Norio's post, I think, where where, where he said, I I give up. And this woman said, well, it's not like that. You know, you know, there's a lot of evidence. And then she said, well, basically, she described almost a religious experience. It's like, well, you really have to believe because, you you know, in your heart, it's true that there's there's been aliens here. It's like, what? Then that's a religion. That's that's a belief based system. It's not it's not it's not based on reason. And dare I say it? I don't want to say science, because I don't think science can be applied to the UFO thing the way it is now, at least not completely. But the woman basically made an argument for it being a belief-based thing, and that's all it was. Kind of like Michael Sala said, well, people have problems with my method because it doesn't rely on verifiable evidence or uh, or uh, research. <laughs> yeah, well, that, and that's fine. If you're willing to admit that it's a belief-based system, I have no problem with you. I put you over in the category of some of my religious slash evangelical friends or relatives, and I say, well, that's great. No problem. I I have no argument with you. Don't try and convert me, but you can believe whatever you want to believe. Perfectly fine. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel about it. The only people that bother me are people that get nasty about it or are just, I I say willfully ignorant. And and that implies somebody saying, I'm going to be stupid and screw you. But it's not that. What I mean by willfully ignorant is they just, they will not listen to anything you say. And if it, uh, some skeptics do this too. As soon as you start arguing, you know, discussing the point they were discussing, if they have a point, they'll change the subject to something else. And you're going, well, wait, just a second. We weren't even talking about this. And I, I see this a lot too. The weird thing is, maybe when I started out, the true believers bothered me a lot more than they do now because I kind of, well, I did. I looked down on them because it's from a sort of logical, rational, educated point of thinking, belief is a wonderful thing. It's just, it doesn't fit into the worldview that I generally fit into. So that's fine. But as I've gone on, I, it's like, hey, let's live and let live. Unless you're really, really, really saying something truly stupid, I generally, you know, bygones be bygones, you follow your path and I'll follow mine. That's fine. The people that bother me, not so much because they take advantage of people. I mean, I'm not on a crusade to save the true believers. They just bother me because they're dishonest. Are the hucksters, the con men, the grifters, the liars, those sorts of people. Your friend, Sean David Morton, for instance. He's the only person that really actually truly bothers me, but that's because of personal experience. Go ahead. There you go. See, I've never had the personal experience with him, so he bothers me in a theoretical sense in that I know he's out there and I know he's crooked, but he's never done anything to me. So, you know, he's bad, but I don't spend a whole lot of time ever really talking about him until now. Yeah. (laughs) But I'm doing that because you're here. But, you know, guys, there are guys out there. Like, I don't think Michael Sala, for instance, is a con man so much as he's delusional and crazy. Alfred Weber falls into the same category. 
So I like to make fun of these people. Yeah, they're hard. But I, yeah, generally speaking, to me, they're like the contactees, or at least guys like George Adamski. There might have, maybe there were some contactees who had legitimate experiences, but Adamski was not one of them. That's fine. You know, I, yeah. I came to the conclusion that eventually enjoy him for what he was, because history in any field of endeavor is replete with these kind of people. So that's fine. He wasn't hurting anyone. But there are people that I do find who do, and Morton's one of them. You know, Sean David Morton is certainly one of them. And obviously the cult leaders like Marshall Applewhite are a different kind of con man. That's where true belief, you know, really goes off the deep end and, and people can get really hurt even more than, say, Sean David Morton would hurt people because people, yeah. people die. You know, and then in the lesser category, sort of it's kind of like the greater gods. And then in the demigod category, there's Gene Steinberg, who I'm not a fan of. Anyone who does stuff like that, they bother me. But true believers, they don't bother me. What do you say... And this is this is one of the few things for me where you know my mate I've got a stock answer for it. People say, well, uh, people in positions of authority and who should know better and who are otherwise very stable say, I've seen it. I know that there is some sort of presence here, whether they call it alien or whatever, and I'm convinced of it because of what I've seen in my contacts of, with people and and you know information that's been passed around. And, you know, my stock answer for that is, that's great. Why can't we all see that? Why do we have to trust them? But but what do you think when somebody... Because that may be, you know, as far as aliens are here, one of the stronger cases, but ultimately unprovable. Well, my talking point answer is I, I generally give the same answer that you do. That's great. Um, as Nick Pope famously has said many, many times, interesting if true. Yes. Does he still say that? No, I think he more, these days he more says, interesting if I get paid, <laughs> which I'm good, I'm perfectly good with, you know, I'm not being critical there. Some people would say that in a critical way. I don't. I, I, I wish I get paid to do this kind of stuff. That'd be fun. So yeah, you know, it's like interesting if true kind of thing. It's just, it's true for you. I, I have friends who do that. I have, um, a business partner, actually, who claims to have seen UFOs when he was younger. He was on a beach, and uh, these, I think as he puts it, these balls of light flew over, and he even signaled to them with a flashlight, and they blinked back, and that sort of thing. And so I'll be sitting there, you know, talking about business, and every now and then this will come up. And I don't know. You're like, what do you say? He's an educated man. He's a rational person. He's a good guy. I don't know what to say to him other than, okay. I've never had that experience. I had a couple of weird things happen maybe when I was doing ghost cases, but I've never had that experience. Nothing quite like that. So I, how do you expect me, what do you want me to do? <laughs> Is sort of my answer like, thank you. And it's kind of the reason, one of the reasons why I stopped going to UFO conferences. Because as much fun as they were, you can go to Laughlin at the International UFO Conference or wherever they hold it now, and it's always fun. But you'd always get people walking up to you and saying, hey, I got this story. Let me tell you the story. And then you'd listen to the story and you'd go, well, if I was Nick Redfern, I'd write that down and put it in a book, but I'm not. And what do you want me to do with that? Well, you should make a film about it. Right. Um, I don't know what you, like, how am I going to do that? Because it's just you talking. Well, that'd be a film. No, no, it's not. I'm sorry. What I got from the hundreds probably of people that came up to me after lectures and told me, you know, this happened to me. 90% of them, may, well, maybe not that much. So few people want to stand there and talk forever. But, okay, 75% of them, they would tell their story, and I would make a comment, and they would, you know, say thank you and walk away. Or they'd say nothing. And you know, I realized what it was. They want to tell somebody that is going to let them, one, finish the story, and two, not laugh at them. Maybe it's the film thing. I did get more people than probably you did saying, oh, this would make a great film, including Steve Bassett. He tried to get me to make an exopolitics documentary once. And um, I probably should have said yes, given how much money Stephen Greer probably raised to do Sirius. Yeah. Or I, I would have said to Bassett, hey, you've got $600,000 or whatever it is to do the citizens hearing on disclosure. How about giving half of that to me and I'll make a film and then you can do the citizens hearing on disclosure. Speaking, look at that segue. Speaking of the citizens hearing on disclosure, which happened a year ago, I think a year ago this past weekend. Ah, uh, yeah. That's right. Somebody, uh, Shepard Johnson on the UFO Updates page post, I guess he was there, he posted a photo of Kevin Randall. So 
has anything changed, Greg? Has the universe changed because Kevin Randall and Nick Pope and Richard Dolan and all those guys went there and talked to those crazy ex-politicians in the fake congressional hearing, and there was this palpable energy that this is it, the disclosure clock is moved to one to midnight, and Bassett was going, it's going to happen. Did it? Well, what happened? I'm going to say exactly probably what you would say. Absolutely nothing and nobody cares, and they didn't care the day after it was over. That could be the title of the film about it, though, the day after it was over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What it was is exactly what you would think it would be, and any, any of you and I or a lot of people we know would think it would be. It raised interest in, some, in the thing for, for the time that it was happening amongst a very small minority of people, and then it was gone. And the reason was is because you cannot produce these kind of things on demand, and people can't take to heart, especially the people that tell us what to think, you know, the academia and the press and scientists and all that, and they have a point. If you can't produce this on demand for everybody, it's not something that anybody would normally encounter it's a non-issue for most people it's a non-issue which is what what the what the uh, disclosure people are worried about they want to have what they think is going on um, revealed to the public so they can say i told you so to some degree i think some of them you know just want to cash a paycheck and other people like the attention that they wouldn't get anywhere else and so, and a, a large number of them genuinely do believe and it's interesting to me it's a sociological thing where you can look at something like that and take a look at the speakers list and go okay which one of those three categories do they fall into <laughs> do they just want the paycheck do they really just want the attention that they wouldn't get otherwise or are they genuinely sort of true believers in this or are they kind of a combination of the three so i think all of them are a combination of the three to varying degrees sometimes almost to the exclusion of the other category or categories, but yeah. Yeah, and then you can almost play a drinking game of trying to fit like, hey, Rich Dolan, which one of those three categories predominates for Richard Dolan? Is it the true belief? Is it the, hey, I got to make some money? Or is it the, I got a master's degree in history, which, you know, thousands upon thousands of other people have, which isn't terribly special, but this might be the one small area where I can become the big fish in a little pond. I mean, which one of those three things predominates? And on any given day with Dolan, pick one. But some other guys, you would look at them and go, yeah, I think that guy really is 95% true belief. Or that guy's 80% give me money. So it varies from person to person. Yeah. And, well, you know, that's, that's all you're left with when you're trying to prove something that can't be proven to most people. It's just, it's going to be up in the air. <laughs> for who knows how long maybe forever i like how your voice sort of went up there at the end maybe forever it sort of yeah. trailed yeah, there you go again yes it's like eric cartman maybe forever maybe for evie <laughs> exactly that's right <laughs> just go to casa Mia or whatever it is that he goes to it's like i finally made it casa bonita. casa bonita that's right yeah 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 there is a casa bonita it really exists so do ufos <laughs> Yeah, but I can take you to Casa Bonita. <laughs> you can take me to a UFO, too. Yeah, if I'm Stephen Greer, I can. Ha ha. Exactly. So you said something that I found interesting. Let's explore this. There, there's an awkward... Paul Kimball's Awkward Segways, Volume 4. You said that the people that try and tell us what to think or give us the answers or whatever, uh, the press, academia... You didn't say science, but by academia, I think you might have meant... Or you would include science. I did say science. Did you? Oh, so okay. I missed that. So my question would be, yeah, I have no doubt that the corporate media, generally speaking, is trying to construct a narrative that they want us to follow to lead us in a certain place. So I'll leave them aside. But do you really think that academia, as a sort of generalized group, and it's not a monolithic entity, of course, even somebody like Richard Dolan, uh, for all my um, slams against him as being a lousy historian, could be claimed to be in academia. Do you think that academia, whatever that is, really has this mission to fit us into or to direct us to certain answers or do you think because you hear this a lot from the true believers oh the academia is pushing us in this one direction they won't listen to us blah 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 or do you think they would prefer that we just ask intelligent questions and if our answers are different than the ones that are sort of the standard if we can prove that those answers that we have come up with are actually better than the ones even in history you know we hey new evidence so it changes the way that we look at a particular event in the past, or hey, a new experiment in science has changed the way we look at something in science and established theory. 
all the time I see historians revising what they've written or what other people have written. I see science changing the way it looks at the universe. So is academia really as monolithic and uh, as, hey, you have to believe this, as the sort of true believers would have us believe? When I bring up science and academia, I do not bring it up as some sort of conspiracy. What I bring it up as is an entrenched way of looking at things that has a hard time dealing with something novel and anomalous in a way that's serious. That's kind of what I mean, not this, you know, monolithic conspiracy to keep the truth down. I don't I, I don't think that happens at all, except with certain, you know, skeptical people that are so skeptical they're believers. What I'm talking about is just basically the structure of it, which does not like the boat rocked. And a lot that's what an institution is. I mean, it, it, it is a certain way of looking at things and a certain way of doing things, with, which supposedly has the greater good of everybody in mind. But no, it's, it's uh, like I said, it's dealing with something that's strange, which is the problem for these, these institutions, not somebody actively trying to suppress, although I think that happens occasionally. It's just by the nature of what it is and by the nature of institutions, things don't happen very quickly and they don't allow, they, they, they don't allow something that's too far off the beaten path of, of, of an open door, at least for very long. And that's, you know, that's kind of a problem, but that you, you, can't really, you can't really change that. I know I repeated myself, but I, I hope I made it clear that I don't think there's some kind of vast conspiracy about it. Uh, what I think there is is just an entrenched way of looking at things that has a hard time dealing with the anomalous. There, there's, there's the short version. <laughs> it's also the title of Greg's next book, An Entrenched Way of Looking at Things, Dealing with the Anomalous by Greg Bishop. Dealing with the Anomalous, yeah, that, that's the subtitle. The first one, the, the, the main title is um, Lies! Exclamation point. Actually, I like that. I was going to say, not a book by Nick Redford. <laughs> I found some of his books when I was cleaning up the other day that were that were next to the bed that I'd read most or part of, and they all had things like another one from the book factory. Best Nick, you must have turned around. Here's another book I wrote, Nick. <laughs> I think it was his most recent monster one, Monster Files. He dedicated to me, and I said, "Wow, you've really hit the 200 book mark if you." <laughs> <laughs> if you're dedicating a book to uh, me, because that's not going to move units when people open and go, dedicated to Paul Kimball, ah, book burning ceremonies on the White I House lawn. I think you like being disliked by people. Is that true? Depends on who the people are. Oh, okay. Yeah. So That makes sense. I, I actually quite like being liked. I'm just not willing to say or do anything that goes against what I actually feel or believe in order to be liked. I see. If I see something, yeah, like I didn't, um, it's back to the thing about Kevin Randall. I, the last year, and folks can go look at my blog if they want to read about it, so I'm not going to get into it. But yeah, Kevin and Randall, Kevin Randall and I fell out, boo-hoo. I didn't do it because I wanted blog hits or because I wanted people to send me hate mail. I did it because it was something that I was involved in against, I didn't want to be involved in. And I saw that, in my opinion, somebody was telling a lie. That would be Kevin Randall. So I thought, you know, I'm going to tell people what I know. That's how I roll. So, and people can agree or disagree with me, but I, I just find it, the one thing that really bothers me the most, Greg, is all these people running around. It really does. This bothers me the most. People running around going, we need the government to tell us everything. We want disclosure. We want the truth, blah, blah, blah. And they're the most hypocritical bunch because most, not all, but most UFO researchers in particular, and I use the term researchers in quotation marks. Yeah have a habit of not telling people the truth or withholding information like the Roswell Dream Team. Yes, we'll release the slides when we're ready. Well, wait, if you have them or if you know about them, tell us now, right? Isn't that what you want the government to do, to tell us now? So on the one hand, it's the, to me, it's the ultimate hypocrisy where you want people who you claim to have the truth to tell you the truth, but you might have something, at least you think you do, so you say, that could lead people to the truth or break it wide open, but you're going to wait until next year, you know, at a press conference or whatever to, to reveal it when presumably you can make some money off it. Well, that, that irks me. That rubs me the wrong way, as it were. So those kind of people can hate me until the cows come home. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite happy because, you know, if you're judged by the quality of your enemies, then I, I think I'm in pretty good stead. But everybody else, you know, like I said, I, I like to be liked like anybody else. I'm just not willing to sacrifice my principles for it.
Yeah, well, that, I understand that. The, the The first thing you said made total sense to me. Depends on who's doing the disliking. <laughs> that, those are words to live by. I like that. Well, it's kind. Of, you should play a game. Would you rather be liked or disliked by this person? And then you know, run the name and go. Hmm, disliked. Ding, 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 ding. Yes, you are. A certain uh, disliked and left alone. I think disliked and bothered constantly. I'd rather they like me <laughs> <laughs> and don't bother you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, generally, I don't know how many people actually dislike me anyway. I mean, it's it's probably a shorter list than most people, including myself, think. But um, although there's people listening right now going, no, it's not. It's a much longer <laughs> list. <laughs> so Greg doesn't even like you. That's he just pretends. <laughs> yeah, that's why one, I'm on the show. And two, I answer you when you uh, call, talk to me or, or send me uh messages you're a spy that's what you are a spy for the dislikers the haters as they say on internet on the internet everybody always goes oh no, i'm not you have to accuse me of being a spy for somebody in power <laughs> well i can't do that my contract with the nsa doesn't allow me to accuse other spies we've got to keep that quiet greg haven't you read this the fine print in your contract until the time is right yeah our contracts are all written on invisible ink too so go ahead try and prove that we're telling a lie um, do you realize it was eight years ago this month? Eight years. Let me do the math. Yes. Eight years ago this month that you first met Mac Tonys in person. I was thinking about this earlier today uh, as I was lying in bed. I'll let people draw their own conclusions um, <laughs> because <laughs> I don't know why. I was actually um, listening to an old podcast that Mac did with another show. We won't mention the name of that show because it sucks. And anybody who thinks I'm talking about the Paracast, I'm not. I'm just saying any show that isn't Greg's or mine sucks. So <laughs> so there you go. Except maybe Tim Banal's. So I was about to say, wow, you, you're fighting with Banal now? No, I guess not. No, I was on his... You're both Boston fans. I was on so. his baseball thing. Um, yeah. You know, whatever. Although I almost didn't do it, but I, I decided I did in, in the end. And yeah, so it was eight years ago that Mac and I were... Um, filming best evidence well i was filming best evidence and i took mac along out to la with me and that you met we had that is it legendary i don't think so i like to call it legendary but we had that i don't know it's legendary for eight people maybe episode yeah, where well, it's legendary for me so it's legendary exactly so the the only two people who matter you and i consider it legendary <laughs> and i'm pretty sure mac did too so we're three for three on Radio Mysterioso, which you can still hear you can google it folks or check it on the interweb it's it's still out there so eight years on from your first in-person meeting with Mac, or as we like to call him, the Mannequin King, <laughs> uh, let's reflect a bit on Mac, because it, it's maudlin, and there's nothing like a Monday morning <laughs> sort of thing to reflect on your dead friend. Do you think people actually still care about Mac Tonys and what he was writing? Has he, has he had any sort of impact? You know, it's sort of four years after he passed away, too. What do you think his legacy is as time rolls on his legacy is going to remain i think apart from the books that you're publishing of his uh, website which is great is the the main book the crypto terrestrials and i still hear people refer to it so i think and it's what i thought you know I, I, it's what i thought it was going to be when mac was writing it. i told him it's like you know when he showed me or read bits and pieces to me over the phone I said, this is going to be the kind of book where people say, I never noticed this before. It's, you know, uh, where's the next one? Or now it's going to be too bad he didn't write another one. I never noticed this before. This is a new way of thinking about it, at least a different way of thinking about things and more deeply thinking about things. And more people, like, you know, every year I hear more people that have read that book. And that's good. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, he, he made a splash, and I'm sorry he couldn't make a, make a bigger one because he's not around, but enough of one that people know who he was and people are learning from what – and having their minds expanded in the way they think about the, the paranormal from his book. That makes me happy. The, you know what? You, you bring up Mac, and the weird thing was is I was cleaning up the house because we're getting a new bed in here, and I was, I was moving some furniture, and I found Mac's drawing he did for me when we were in the studio during that show on the back of the piece of paper with the questions I had for you guys on it. Really? Wow. Yeah. I'd say that was synchronicity, but I've been to your apartment. So <laughs> 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 I know that the odds were pretty. No, it is because it was, it was in a black hole, like behind a filing cabinet. 
I think I had it propped up or on the wall and it just fell back there and I picked it out. It's like, oh my God, this is the thing I was going to get framed because it's, 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 a, it's a gray alien head and then he signed it. I know. And that would be your apartment though. And I'm not being critical because my bedroom looks even worse. And your apartment is actually quite neat, except for your little work area. Yeah, my work area is I don't even go near it anymore because it's, it's such a disaster area. And, and that, that is uh, going to be cleaned very soon. With this, uh, I'll probably find all kinds of wonderful treasures in, in the uh, strata on that desk. I like that. All kinds of wonderful treasures. You should bring Nick out and you say, Nick, we're going on a little crypto terrestrial hunt in my, in my bedroom, in my work area. See what Nick says. I'm not coming. Oh, no, I've seen that, Greg. I'm not coming. Ah, it's scary, frightening. <laughs> I'd rather face Chupacabra and Bigfoot than, yeah. Well, welcome. Yeah, come to my bedroom, you'll, or my work area. It's funny. You and I both have our work areas in our bedroom. Yeah, well, there's not really a r other room in, that, in, the, in the place for it. It's a one-bedroom apartment. Cigarette has to work in the kitchen in the breakfast nook. That's her desk. We shouldn't tell people this because it makes us look poor. What we should be doing is saying, <laughs> we're rich paranormal moguls with our haciendas, or in my case, Scottish castle. You know, you could have a hacienda because you're in California. My large ranch house on a, on a decent piece of land so I don't have to listen to people. That, that's my spot. You know what you should have? You should have a ranch house in Rancho Cucamonga. <laughs> There's all kinds of great names like it that sound stupid. Cucamonga, Tarzana, named after Tarzan, Edgar Rice Burroughs Tarzan. And then, of course, there's Azusa. And you wonder, what is what the hell is it? Where did that come from? Is that some, some exotic name? No, it's because when they founded the town, the city, they said it had everything from A to Z in the USA. Stupid! Did you put that in your weird California book? No, because that's about the end of the story. and that, that, that does not a story make, unless there was some scandal involved with it, which I don't think there was. You could always create a scandal. You could hire Walter Bosley to write a book about it somehow. Alistair Crowley and no, I'm not. I'm just Walter's. <laughs> I shouldn't be making. He could call it the Empire of the Wheel Ease. It could be all about little kids riding their bike, and when they lift the front of their bike, it's a symbol to the Illuminati to begin their murderous spree in Azusa. <laughs> now you're getting ridiculous, Paul. Ah, oh, the the Empire. Of the, I like that. The Empire of the Wheelies. <laughs> It sounds like a kid's movie. Yeah, exactly. It could be the kid version of Empire of the Wheel, which for anybody who doesn't know is a series of books that Walter's writing, which is actually, they're kind of fun. I enjoy reading them. So back to Mac, <laughs> because why? People don't want to listen to us talk about our lives because they hate me. And I don't know why they don't hate you, because you say just as many sort of, you know, cranky things as I do. And you get a pass. I'm saying more cranky things than I have, and I don't know why. It probably has something to do with me, you know, the same reason I came on my show last night and said, why am I even doing this? It really worries me when I don't, I'm not saying, who can I get on the show next? And, you know, how, how quickly can I get this, this program edited and up and ready for people to hear? Am I in a lull or did I give up? I have no idea. It, like I said, Paul, that it, it just, it kind of worries me seeing what my, you know, if my motivation is still there. If it's not, that scares me. But why does it scare you? And I'm sure you don't mean literally scares you in an existential, I'm going to die kind of way. But no. if you just stopped, if you just said, eh, you know what, it's been a good run, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of doing this, uh, I'm not going to do it anymore. That would, to me, would mean one of two things. Either you're heading for a senior citizen's home, or <laughs> you're moving on to do something that you find more interesting, which that would be fine. So what, where, as Bugs Bunny would say, wherefore the fear? No, wait, that's the Tasmanian devil who would talk like that. <laughs> wherefore the fear, Bunny? Yeah. So why, why afraid? There's a lot of things in that mix, and we can get back to Mac too. There's a lot of things in that mix there in that question that you ask, which is a very good question. And I like it. And you're the only person that would have ever asked me that. Especially in the Tasmanian devil voice. Yes, Exactly. There's so many things in that feeling that I had that scared me. And the main one is, I think, I've been, you know, concerned or interested in this subject for many, many, I mean, since I was a kid, there was a large lull in the middle of my life when I was, you know, in high school and college. Then I, I came back. And that means it's like saying, okay, I'm going to retire. And a lot of people, oh, great. Let me close the window. Wow, that's loud. Can you hear it still? 
I can, but it... Oh, wait, it's gone now. Okay, well, I'll try and turn this away from the horrible noise. It adds, it adds a certain charm to the show. I think what they're, I think they're, I think they're cutting concrete out there. Oh, that definitely sounds like they're cutting concrete. Yeah, but that's okay because people, this is just part of the journey, right? Yeah, it's ridiculous. Anyway, um, you think you you do something for years and years and years, twenty something years, and then suddenly you or maybe not suddenly, but over the course of a few months or weeks or whatever, you don't do it anymore, and then you're kind of like, you know, where's where's my foundation? What do I do? And the other part of it, and it, while you were asking the question, I thought of this, and, and it's embarrassing, is, one, I've made so many friends, you know, w- with this subject, and two, for quite a while, I got to get up and talk in front of people, and that's fun. I mean, it, it boosts your ego and all that, and I'll admit it. I mean, I've met, never made a whole bunch of money off it or anything like that, but... It's fun to be able to get up in front of people and talk and then take their questions and have an interaction with them. I like that, you know, and not to the point it's like, oh, I got to do something because, that, you know, I need attention. But I didn't get into this or write what I did or anything like that to get attention. I did because I was interested. And one of the one of the fringe benefits is every once in a while, somebody would fly me somewhere that I had never been before to hang out with a bunch of friends and, and, and talk to a group of strangers, whether hostile or or not. And I, I enjoyed that. I don't know if I'm going to do it anymore. And so that, that there, there's a wistful feeling about that. It's not like, oh, I got to do something so that you know more people will listen to me or want to hear what I have to say or read what I, that. That's not that motivation. But there, there, like I said, there's a kind of a wistful feeling there. Oh, well, it was kind of fun, you know. Or a peaceful, easy feeling, as the Eagles would say. <laughs> God, I hate that song and that group. Yeah, I kind of like that song, but I'm not a fan of the group. Yeah, well, I was never invited to speak at conferences, so I don't know that wonderful feeling. I did go to one once on Stephen Bassett's time. I should be a lot easier on Bassett. At least he paid me to go to the X, XCon in 2007, so fair enough. Although I had to, yeah, I had to hit him up for the money before I left because I knew I'd never get it if I left without actually getting the check, so I heard that from other people. Yeah, it's, it's, it is fun to stand up and talk to, talk in front of people, isn't it? sort of about anything really yes it is fun i it's uh interesting fun and uh and there's other yeah oh you said is there anything else you've been invited to talk about is that what you're asking sure, sure. Yes. yes although now <laughs> i think i'm getting yeah i'm getting a bit of an echo now on your hello yeah good Here. okay i'm not let, yeah let, it sounds like you're you ever see the show land of the lost with slee stacks Yes. It sounds like you have a horde of slee stacks outside. Oh, that's great. Okay, yeah, exactly. I, I like the noise now. I, I uh, might even I might even go find an MP3 of some slee stacks and stick them in at <laughs> other points just to go. And then I'll dub in. Like, Greg, here we can do it right now. Greg, did you hear that? It, it sounds like a what is that? Is that a slee stack? <laughs> what do you think those things are that caught us? I don't know. Hey, maybe it's a a slee stack. Well, I'm sorry. It's awake again. Oh, I hope it's not dreaming of lunch. I'm afraid it is. You know what I think is still keeps you interested and probably still keeps me interested? It's all the, I use this term with love and affection crazy people or let's call them iconoclastic people or different people or interesting or fun or amazing whatever you like like george van tassel for instance yeah. people who have stories that are just a little different than the average story that you see on an average day and it's funny when i was talking to this friend i met at a bar on saturday night about the paranormal and everything i, I kind of said to him i said look because he was he was sort of bemoaning where he is in his life and he said, um, you know, when I'm gone, nobody's going to remember me. And I kind of thought about that. And I said, well, first of all, within 100 years, unless you happen to be like Dwight Eisenhower or Hitler or something, nobody's going to remember any of us. Right. But more importantly, why do you care? You're going to be dead. So yeah. there's, there's either nothing and you won't know or you've moved on to something infinitely more interesting and you won't care. But the important thing is 
to make sure that you're the person who's writing your story as opposed to letting somebody else write your story for you. Because we're all writing our own story, so or we're all living our own story. And I think so many people kind of allow, they sit back for whatever reason, and they let their story be written by someone else. Or at least they get sort of a Reader's Digest, a bridge version of what living should be. But you find guys... A lot easier. Yeah. But you find these guys, some of them are crooks, some of them are liars, some of them are adventurers and explorers. I mean, they're all sort of the same, who are writing their own story. A guy like George Van Tassel. So I used to look at George Van Tassel and I'd just go, he's either a crook and a liar or he's crazy, one of the two. Now I look at him and I go, don't care. He's interesting. He did something different. And in a, in a cookie cutter world, finding these guys and these girls is, it's sort of like, well, I was just going to say, it's sort of like being interesting, which is a terribly uninteresting thing to say. But it is. They're, they're like little nuggets of gold in a river full of fool's gold. And I think that's what still keeps you interested. You're like the Huell Hauser of the paranormal. The people and the stories interest you more than maybe even the search for whatever the truth is. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the theorizing about it interests me, too. And the, my whole thing over the last few years of how much of this are we creating ourselves and how much do we, uh, of, the, of, of the phenomenon... And how much do we acknowledge that we're creating a lot of it ourselves? You know, not not in a way where I say we're making stuff up. So it's, no, we're. I think we're interacting with something, and that interaction is what we think it is. And that's not what I don't think that's what it is. That interests me just as much as George Van Tassel, or you know, no matter how much I dislike him, uh, crazy Sean Morton, or you know, what the hell is Stephen Greer doing now when he's waving his arms around? And, and trying to get recruits or whatever. that That's interesting to me and fun. I just have this picture now of Greer running towards a cliff, flapping his arms, going, I can fly, I can fly, <laughs> I swear I can fly. And then jumping off the cliff, and as he's falling to his death, he passes you and your paraglider, sort of scooting along, and you go, well, that's interesting, if true. <laughs> We've said absolutely nothing in this episode that I think we haven't said before. So people will listen to this and go, ah, it's like sitting in front of the fireplace with a couple of old friends. Yeah, that's exactly what they're going to say. Um, no, we've said some different stuff. In fact, I've said stuff that kind of worries me, which is good. Uh-oh. Um, well, I'm going to have to listen to this episode again. Then. Uh, <laughs> which I'm going to have to do... If you hear something where you think that I should have said it, which you would never think that, I'd have to hear it. Please tell me. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to keep everything in. I'm going to cut most of my stuff out, but I'm going to keep everything you said in. It'll make yeah, it a, I know. That's fine. Because I'm a windbag, so that will make it a shorter episode. What's new? What's Greg Bishop coming? When's your new book coming out? What new book? That's the other thing that worries me. I tried to start a book about um, about New Mexico and a lot of the weirdness and, and maybe some of the dulcy stuff. And it the, my main contact dropped off and didn't want to talk to me anymore. And that's, that's mystifying to me. So I'm going to have to <laughs> try to find something else. I am working on a, another project with another writer, which I will not talk about right now. Not because I'm trying to be secretive, but because if I start talking about it, it's going to make me ever more or less, I'm ever more likely to not do anything about it because the, all the energy will go out of it. So, um, and it's not something groundbreaking or anything like that. It's just a fun project. You heard it here first, folks. Greg Bishop is working on a project with somebody he won't name about a subject he won't name about a subject that isn't groundbreaking. It's a quasi-UFO book. so Or it's a book about quasi-UFOs. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Um, quasi-UFOs, yeah. Qua yeah. <laughs> you are writing the foreword, so I hear, to Nick Redfern's new Men in Black book that I'm publishing, um, Strange yes. Tales of the Men in Black. All I'm doing is writing forewords and introductions to books now. Well, it's a lot easier. It doesn't pay as well, but... No, it doesn't pay at all. <laughs> yeah, well, not if it's for my company, it doesn't, no. Any um, company. Yeah, no, I know, that's true. Uh, is there anything else you want to say to the vast listenership of The Other Side of Truth? Uh, listen to everything I said and realize that no matter how cynical I get, I still have friends in the paranormal and uh, that I've met through it that make me very happy, which is probably why I won't give it up quite yet. You couldn't have said it better. That has absolutely no bearing to why I stay interested in the paranormal. I just like causing trouble. <laughs> well, and then there's, a, you know, there there is a mystery that it's fun to roll around mentally and uh, discuss with people and and uh, f figure out the facets of of which they are many and that that still that's that still holds an interest for me too obviously 
While I'm not exactly sure this was an episode about anything, but like every uh, opening episode of The Other Side of Truth, you know, it's just kind of kicking things off, two old friends chatting. We'll bring Greg back at the end of the season, and we'll have him do a, we'll do a recap of the entire season with whoever I, <laughs> is there anybody who will still talk to me? You and Aaron Gullius, that's probably it. So <laughs> it'll be 10 episodes of Aaron Gullius with Greg sandwiched as bread on either side. <laughs> but he won't be white bread. He'll be more like crusty rye. Yes, thank you. There you go. So this has been The Other Side of Truth, Season 3 kicking off. My guest today has been Greg Bishop, all the way from Los Angeles. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Greg, for accepting my call. Thanks, Paul. I hope, hope I said something useful. I know I did. Yeah, thanks. I like that. That was awesome. So goodbye, folks, and we'll talk to you next time. Toodly-doo. Marshall, Will, and Holly On a routine expedition Met the greatest earthquake ever known High on the rapids It struck their tiny raft And plunged them down a thousand feet below To the land of the lost Yeah.